Well, as we look at the sewer system capacity, there's several considerations uh, that we have to look at. The first is our current flows. You know, what, what type of flow do we have going through the system right now? Um, and those flows come from residential flows, commercial flows, and industrial flows. So when we're looking at, at the capacity or how much our system can handle, not only do we have to look at the current flow, but we have to look to the future. And in, in that case, we look at the development of the town, we look at the commercial and the industrial development in the area, and try to determine what the future flows will be. So when we design a system and we size it for a certain capacity, we have to both or take into consideration both the current flow and the future flow. The third thing we have to look at is infiltration and inflow. How much I and I do we have coming into the system? And that comes from groundwater and also stormwater. And then the last thing, and very important, is the flow velocity in the system. And we need our flow velocity to be sufficient to carry the solids and the organic matter all the way to the treatment plant. And that's where that two feet per second comes in. Now, when taking all this into consideration, if if it looks like we're going to have growth in a city and we build a very large sewer system that's larger than we need now, the problem that we run into is the flow velocity will not be sufficient to carry the solids. So we have to size it as large as we can, but not too large so that we don't have sufficient flow capacity. And one way to know, you know, what it, to help us size our system is to look at the variations in flow. Now you're going to have your lowest flows or your minimum flows generally early in the morning. And this graph is just showing a, a daily flow in a, a typical system. So in the morning you have your minimum flow and then in the middle of the day somewhere between 10 and noon you'll have your highest flow or your peak flow and then it'll drop off a little, come back up in the evening, and then drop off as people are sleeping in the night. Uh, but these flow considerations uh, or flow variations have to be taken into consideration when sizing or designing the system capacity. Well, how do we measure the system capacity? Um, well, one measurement is flow velocity. Uh, again, I'm going to keep saying two feet per second, um, but we want to have the minimum scouring velocity to carry the solids and the organic matter uh, to the treatment plant. But we can measure flow velocity with instrumentation um, that's installed, but we can also use a dye test or a float test. So these are three different ways that we can measure uh, flow velocity in our system, and we'll take a look at each. Well, if you're going to use instrumentation, there's various types of instrumentation that we can use to measure the velocity of flow in a collection system. And they're differentiated by whether the pipe is full or if it's an open channel flow. So if we're talking about full pipe instrumentation, we're generally talking about force mains, so a pressurized system. And the different methods we can use are magnetic, ultrasonic and differential pressure. Well in the magnetic uh, system basically there's a magnetic field that's created around the pipe and as the water flows through since it's a conductor since it will conduct current as it moves through the magnetic field it's going to induce a voltage. So the faster the flow the higher the voltage and that can be calibrated to read out in feet per second. So for the magnetic or the mag meter, they're using a conductor flowing through a magnetic field, the water being the conductor, and flowing through the magnetic field to induce this voltage that can then be measured and related to flow. Ultrasonic sends sound waves into the water and because of the Doppler effect, uh, the, the different rates of flow will cause the sound waves to uh, reach the sensing module at different paces. So you can use the Doppler effect uh, by sending sound waves through the water to determine the flow as well. 
And then the pressure differential, basically it's just a, they choke down the pipe, either through a venturi or some type of orifice. And the difference in pressure uh, from the neck of the pipe or the throat at the smallest point and the pressure upstream, that difference in pressure w can be related to flow as well. So for full pipe instrumentation, we've got mag meters, or it use mag uses magnetism. Um, we have ultrasonic meters, and then we have differential pressure meters. Now in open channels, we have flumes, which again, are, are it's a way of choking down the flow uh, through a constant flow path, and based on the height within that channel, you can estimate the flow. So that's a flume, and here we have pictured partial flumes. You can use a weir, and based on the height in the weir, you can estimate flow. And here pictured, uh, we have a V-notch weir. And then you also have surface velocity and depth measurements. So you can use instrumentation uh, that will detect the surface velocity, such as an ultrasonic meter, and then also the depth of the water, and the combination of the depth and velocity uh, can be converted into a flow measurement. Other uh, open channel methods um, are a die test and a float test. Well, to do the die test, it's a real simple procedure. Uh, basically, you take your die and you insert it through the manhole, and once you drop the die in, you want to record the time. And then you'll have a second person stationed at the downstream manhole. And at the first sighting of the die, he'll record that time. And he'll continue watching until the die is no longer visible. And then he'll record that time as well. So once you drop the die in at the upstream manhole, the person at the downstream manhole will record the time that he first sees the die and the time that he doesn't see it anymore. And you'll take the average of those two times, and that will be your average time. And that's what's used for the calculation. So in step five, you divide the length between the manholes, which could be 300 feet, could be 500 feet. And you'll divide it by the average time in seconds, and that will give you your feet per second, or the velocity in feet per second. So by way of demonstration for the die test, here we have a system. Uh, we've got the street, we've got two manholes, and then we've got the pipe connecting the two. So if we start our flow in the system, and then we take our die and drop it in, it's going to disperse and create some length, and then it will move through. And as it passes that second manhole, that's when the person at that manhole will record both the first sighting and the last sighting, take that average time, and then you divide the distance between the manholes by the average time, and that will give you your flow velocity in feet per second. Similar to the die test is the float test. Well, instead of inserting a die, we're going to insert a float at a manhole, and we're going to mark the time that that float first enters the flow stream or the wastewater. We record that time, and then we, as it goes downstream, the person at the second manhole will record the time that it arrives at that second manhole. And then we simply divide the distance between the manholes uh, by the total seconds, and that will give you your feet per second. So it's the manhole distance um, divided by the time in seconds. And then because there is friction in the pipe, and as the water flows through the pipes, the interaction with the flow of the water with the walls of the pipe, the total flow is not flowing as fast as the float on the surface will flow. So due to this friction loss, you can subtract 10 to 15 percent uh, from your value to get the actual total flow velocity. So here's an example of the float test. Again, we'll get our uh, wastewater flowing, we drop our float into the water, and it rides along the surface to the next manhole. So we're simply recording how long it takes uh, to get to that manhole, and we divide the distance by the average time. 
But remember, we're going to take 10 to 15 percent off of that to get our actual flow velocity. So this float test, as is the die test, is just an estimate of flow velocity. Well, we can use the flow velocity as part of the equation for total flow or total volumetric flow. And that total flow is a very important parameter for us to monitor. And by plotting that total flow in million gallons per day will help us identify if we have a problem with inflow um, or infiltration. So if we plot our flows regularly at different points within the system, um, we can see what's normal for different times of the day, different times of the year, under different conditions, and then we'll have that data to compare uh, in the future to see if we're seeing regular flows um, or if we're having excess flow, which could be due to inflow or infiltration. So collecting flow data and evaluating the flow data is very important as a collection system operator. So this helps you to get to know what's normal for your system um, so you can identify an abnormal condition.